In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the two Sundays that precede Christmas Day, the church, in her wisdom, commemorates all the righteous men and women of the Old Testament, the forefathers of the Christian faith. And as I have done in years past, I have taken one of those forefathers, Isaiah, Abraham, David, Tamar, Ruth, and I have conducted, I pretended that I was like a Larry King and I was interviewing these saints and giving you what I think they may have been saying to the questions that I asked from the hymns of the church, from the things that they did and said in the Bible or tradition. Uh, last, just last December, I interviewed St. Joseph the righteous, the innocent sufferer, who suffered much abuse from others, including his own brothers, his own family. And I'm reminded of that verse from the Psalms, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but out of them all, God delivers him. And in Joseph's case, Joseph not only was delivered, not only did he endure this abuse, but he ended up coming off better than he was previously before the trauma. It's an amazing story. I feel like we need to do more work in the lives of the Old Testament saints and the stories of the Old Testament. I, I've always felt that way. Anyway, today is the third Sunday of Pascha, and we celebrate another Joseph today, Joseph of Arimathea. So I decided to conduct another interview to see what we can glean from his life. In the hopes that it may be good and beneficial for our souls. So let's get right to the interview with the noble Joseph. Noble Joseph. I mean, this is Joseph saying it, not you. <laughs> Alithosanesti, father. So now, Joseph, it seems to me that by you saying Alithosanesti, that means something more to many of us who just kind of say it as a knee jerk reaction. Yes, father, that is true because I actually held the dead Jesus body in my arms. So, yes, when I say alithosanesti, truly he has risen. It's, it means something to me. You're right. So, Joseph, um, you know, the scriptures and the church tradition do not tell us much about your, your early life. You, you know, from Arimathea. Where, where is Arimathea? Tell us about your early years. Well, Father, Arimathea is a small little town about seven and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem. At least it was in my day. And uh, as far as, you know, anything momentous happening in... No, not really. You know, it was just... It was like you're Cleveland and Buffalo. It means something to you. It's your, it's, it feels like home to you. But uh, no, nothing momentous happened in Arimathea. Now, as far as my upbringing, since you asked... I was fortunate enough to be born of noble parents. You know, I know that your churches call me the noble Joseph, and I'm flattered by that. But I got to tell you, it was my parents that were noble. Good people, Father. Good people. Not perfect, but they pursued the good. And they wanted what was best for me. They cared deeply about my character and about my education. And Joseph, what was your education? What can you tell us? Did you have a particular interest? Oh yes, Father, being a Jew, we were trained in the scriptures. What you call the Old Testament, that was our scriptures back then. We didn't have a New Testament then. 
but we studied. And I'll tell you, Father, what really interested me was the, uh, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, and all the things they said and they foretold about my people, ancient Israel, and especially about the Messiah who would come to save my people. Oh, Father, how I looked forward to the kingdom. Well, St. Joseph, you obviously uh, excelled in your studies and you took them seriously because you became an elder for your people. And you were a rather prominent, you had a prominent role in a very elite governing body called the Sanhedrin. Can you tell us something about the Sanhedrin and this governing body? Yes, Father, the Sanhedrin were made up of uh, 70 elders, 70 men, and the high priest. They were the decision makers, the governing body over disputes that the smaller courts couldn't seem to handle. It's like your present day Supreme Court. That's what we were. Noble Joseph, I'm a bit hesitant to ask this next question, almost embarrassed but I think I need to ask. Ask, Father, it's okay. I think I know where you're going. Well, is this not the same governing body which you were a part of that is best known for its mock trials of the Lord Jesus and trumped up charges against him that resulted in the arrest and crucifixion of the very Messiah that you say you were seeking and looking forward to. Yes, Father, the decision was made by this governing body to turn Jesus over to the Roman authorities to be tried and crucified. I have no defense for that. Thank you for your candor, good saint. You know, as a priest of over 30 years now, I have been given the Ophikion, the uh, status of Father Confessor. And so from that status, and in my humble opinion, I want to tell you, if I dare to tell you this, Joseph, tell it, Father, you are the priest. Tell it. And in my humble opinion, this decision by the council was not your sin. Well, Father, yes and no. There were at least a couple of us who did not consent to this decision. One of them you know by name, Nicodemus. In your English translation, you call him Nicodemus. He was the saint that came to Christ by night for fear of the Jews. Yes, we read about him in scriptures, <clears throat> Joseph. But what do you mean, yes and no? My pastoral sense tells me that you have some personal remorse over this situation. Yes, Father, indeed, there is a hidden sin within me that overwhelms me with shame. Oh, how effectual and powerful the mystery of sacrament and holy confession is to expose sin. Father, I hope you encourage your people to take advantage of that mystery of confession. It is so healing. It's true. I am not guilty of wanting to pursue the death of Messiah. That is true. I am not guilty of blindly denying the obvious that my colleagues did, that Jesus was God. It was obvious. But my sin was a lack of courage. I caved to peer pressure. I was silent when I should have defended him. I see. Well, tell me, what happened then between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. on Holy Friday that brought such courage to you to actually go to Pilate, the governor, and ask for the body of Jesus? I'm not sure, Father. I don't know what happened. I don't know what came over me, but it was effortless. The courage... I didn't stir it up. It was effortless. It just was there. Maybe for the first time in my life, truth and love mattered more than my fear. 
It mattered more than my position. It mattered more than my status. It mattered more even than my wealth, which I lost because of this. All that mattered to me was to give our Messiah an honorable merit, uh, an honorable burial. Oh, noble Joseph, how beautiful. God gave you repentance. But how ironic. What do you mean, Father Paul? I mean, it's ironic that did you realize that you took charge of his burial, that you, when you did that, that you, you who are a lover of prophecy and studied the prophets, that actually you were part of a fulfillment of a prophecy 800 years before. When Isaiah said, I will assign rich men for his death. Oh my goodness, Father. I never realized that. That is amazing, actually. I, I don't know what to say. Well, we must begin to close now. But tell me, before closing, I'm curious. What was your approach with Pilate? I mean, there was no guarantee he was going to give you the body. That's an excellent question, Father. And perhaps my response can wind up the interview. First, let me tell you what I didn't say. I did not use pompous and high-sounding words and platitudes because I knew that anger and arrogance does not work the righteousness of God. Well, what then? What did you say? It was just a lowly, pitiful plea, really. One of your hymns describes it very well. May I just say the hymn? Because actually the hymn does a better job of what I did. Please, by all means, say it. O oh, judge, I have come to make a trifling request. Give me a dead man for burial. Give me Jesus, the poor. Give me Jesus, the homeless. Give me Jesus, the crucified, the naked. Give me Jesus, the common carpenter's son. Give me, O Prince Pilate, this stranger, who from infancy has been a stranger in the world. Give me this stranger whom his own race hated and delivered unto death as a stranger. Give me this stranger that I may hide him in a tomb, for as a stranger he has no place to lay his head. With these words, Father Paul and Holy Trinity, I was able to receive the body. It's so strange, Father, really. You talk about irony. Here I was, clay, standing before clay, Pilate, to receive the fashioner of all. Here I was, grass, asking to receive from grass the heavenly fire. O oh Christ, I offered a narrow grave to you, and I receive as recompense the vast spaciousness of heaven. Thank you, noble Joseph. My friends, let me ask you a question. Are you a secret disciple of fear? Do you lack courage to stand up to your own falsehood, your own fear, your own hypocrisy? Please don't underestimate your noble birth. Please don't underestimate the power of confession and repentance. O oh God, illumine our darkness, and like Joseph, give us boldness and wisdom and love to overcome our fear. God bless you today, my friends. Christos Anesti.